Living safely in his bunker, Joe watches and commentates a football game. His dog, Gilligan, has to go pee and starts to whimper. Joe checks the security camera to make sure the coast is clear before taking Gilly out. Joe looks at the sunset and states, You know, Gilligan, some things are still nice, huh? A montage is shown of Joe's everyday routine such as lifting weights, doing sudokus, and watching football. One night, Joe takes Gilly outside as usual to pee and walkers start to approach. Joe puts up a trap that surrounds him and Gilly with rakes and other sharp tools to stop the walkers from getting to them. However, one of the walkers manages to get through without Joe noticing. Gilly jumps on the walker to save his owner but ends up being devoured in the process. Joe kills the walker, but it is too late. He cries at the loss of his best friend. He buries Gilly near the bunker. Now all alone, Joe becomes very depressed. He no longer enjoys the activities he used to like. One day, he starts angrily throwing books, no longer finding any enjoyment in them. However, he finds a box full of messages he and a user named Ushelbskurd had sent to each other before the outbreak. Both of them were preppers who had been getting ready for the end of the world. Joe reads through the messages until he gets to the part where she talks about meeting with him in person. Joe had been hesitant before the outbreak but now curses himself for being a coward. He packs his stuff and sets out on a journey on his motorcycle to find her. In the middle of the night, while Joe is driving, his tires are popped by some spikes. He walks away and suddenly springs a booby trap that catches him in a net. The person who had set the trap, Evie, approaches the net and kills a walker about to bite Joe. She forces him to cuff himself before freeing him. She then takes Joe captive in her house and explains her situation. She plans on stealing his bike, though she does tell him of some benefits he'll get in exchange. However, she is unable to drive it since Joe has a kill switch, so she forces him to drive her to her destination. Joe remains uncooperative despite Evie's attempts to be friendly. She gifts him a necklace to wear which she puts on him. They hop on his bike and drive off with Evie holding Joe at gunpoint. On the road, Joe and Evie still don't trust each other. When Joe stops to go pee, Evie forces him to put on handcuffs. When Joe returns to continue driving, he puts on headphones and plays music, so he doesn't have to hear Evie. He starts to sing along with the song and Evie attempts to join in, however. One glare from him gets her to stop. Eventually they stop for the night, Evie starts going through Joe's bag to see who he really is. When she grabs his journal, he becomes angered and tells her to stop. Evie starts reading Joe's messages with Sandra. Evie apologizes for prying into Joe's business and reveals she's also looking for someone. Joe doesn't answer and instead lies down to get some rest. Evie puts a blanket on him to keep him warm. The next day, the to go on the road again. Evie looks at the sunset sky in amazement, something Joe once did, and says how there's still magic in the world. Joe initially answers in a very cynical manner, but soon apologizes and concedes that some things are still nice. That night, when the two stop to sleep again, walkers surround them. Joe asks for Evie to take off the cuffs since there are too many walkers to handle by herself. After some hesitation, she throws him a weapon, though he still remains handcuffed. The two fight the walkers and Evie demonstrates her martial arts skills. Now having formed a bond of trust, she gives Joe the keys to uncuff himself. The next day, he teaches her how to drive the motorcycle and they start to bond with each other. This time, the both of them happily sing along with the song together. The two stop for the night again, with Joe finding a drink. He asks Evie where exactly he's taking her and finds out their destinations are only 10 miles apart. He questions her optimism in the apocalypse and she states that the apocalypse made her into who she is. Evie starts talking about her ex-husband Stephen and her hopes of finding him. Joe then gives Evie his journal to see if she can figure out where the person he's looking for is. The next morning, Joe is starting up his bike when Evie calls for him. She reveals that she figured out where user Ushelbskurt is. Joe is ecstatic over the news and laments about how this is the longest he has spent with another person in years. However, while they are talking, 
A man steals Joe's bike and leaves behind a lamb with a sign saying thanks for the bike. Joe grabs Evie's gun and aims at the thief. However, the gun is unloaded, allowing the man to get away. The two continue down the road. Now having to go on foot, Joe is saddened at the loss of his possessions. He blames Evie for their situation and the two begin to argue. He calls her mission to find Stephen foolish and believes that he should have ditched her. However, she calls him out, saying that he had plenty of opportunities to get away. However, he didn't because, deep down, he's lonely and his world never got started, since he was always preparing for the end of the world. Not wanting to hear any more, Joe walks away from Evie and they go their separate ways. Joe manages to track down Ushald Skurd's location. He finds a security camera and yells for her to let him in. She opens the bunker doors and he jumps in, but accidentally hurts his leg. He limps down the hallway and goes downstairs, where he sees Ushald Skurd waiting for him. The two ecstatically greet each other with her revealing her name to be Sandra. She aids Joe walk through the bunker and to the living room. Meanwhile, Evie finds her way to Stephen's cabin. She enters and finds nothing but Stephen's paintings. She looks through them and finds Stephen had painted one of her, but one representing love rather than hate. Though disappointed she didn't find him, she is left satisfied, saying I hope you made it. Sandra offers Joe a brownie and he takes some bites. He talks about his experiences, including Gilligan's death. She tells him she's going to go freshen up. However, it's revealed that the brownie she had given him is drugged. His vision starts to worsen and he becomes delirious. Sandra puts on clown makeup and says she wishes she had met Joe before the outbreak. When he was still a good person, she ties his hands up and slashes the side of his neck with a knife, though he states that he's here for her. Sandra believes that Joe wants to take the bunker for himself and yells at him saying, I don't believe you. Before slashing his neck again and be known to them, Evie is on her way. Sandra explains what had happened to her since the outbreak. She often had people knocking on her door but ignored them. However, one day a man broke in, wanting to take the bunker and kill her. She was forced to kill him, which caused her descent into madness. She goes to kill Joe, but her meat cleaver hits the necklace Evie had given him. Joe fights back, but Sandra subdues him. Right before she can finish him off, the alarms go off. Sandra checks her camera and sees Evie at the entrance. She accuses Joe of wanting to take the place for him and Evie before tying him up to a pole. She wipes the makeup off her face to give herself a presentable appearance. Sandra opens the door of the bunker and invites Evie in, putting on a very inviting and friendly persona. She gives her the drugged brownie, which Evie takes a small bite of. She asks about Joe and Sandra pretends not to have seen him, but Evie gets suspicious. She sits down and Sandra prepares to kill her. However, Evie calls her out on her lies and calls it shady to give someone a cannabis edible without asking. Sandra swings her cleaver at Evie, but she dodges and uses her fighting skills to overpower her. She hears Joe and runs to free him. Sandra charges at them yelling maniacally. Joe throws the cleaver at her, hitting her in the chest and killing her. As Joe, Evie, and the lamb exit the bunker, a now reanimated Sandra walks towards them. They almost make it out, but Sandra grabs Evie's foot. Joe closes the door on Sandra's hand, causing her to lose her grip on Evie. He asks if she found Stephen, and she replies that she didn't, but that's okay. Joe is still high from the brownie and starts bursting out laughing. The next morning, Evie wakes up cuddling the lamb and sees no sign of Joe. However, he then appears and walks over to her, much to her relief. He thanks her for coming back to save him and the two hug. He admits that she is right, that he wasted his life preparing for the end. Evie encourages him, telling him his life isn't over and he can start fresh with her and with a new outlook on life. Joe, Evie, and the lamb happily walk down the road on foot, with Joe giving the lamb a name. Skipper? Blair is one of the worst types of bosses a person can have and probably has had at least once in their lives. She is selfish and overbearing and acts like the whole world revolves around her. Gina, on the other hand, accepts Blair's constant cruelty, remains quietly reserved. 
but is secretly fed up with her boss. They, along with other colleagues, work at an insurance company just as the news of the apocalypse reaches its peak. Blair dismisses it all as fear-mongering but believes it will be good for business. Everyone else is not so sure. Blair goes away with her fiancé Brian for the weekend and gets stuck in line at a gas station waiting for gas. While there she notices Jean arriving. Gina walks into a small gas station convenience store and notices the empty shelves. Gina notices a woman driving by with her husband who has a nasty wound on his neck. This causes her to get a shotgun out of her hatchback and walk up to the oil tanker and demand that the driver give her the keys. Leo Rogers, a nearby national security agent in a car with his son Wendell, sees what is happening and tries to defuse the situation. Blair tries to help by promising not to fire Jeannie, but it doesn't work. Before the situation can boil over, the group hears a woman screaming from the car. Everyone looks over and sees that her zombified husband has thrown her to the ground and is gnawing on her flesh. Roger takes Jeannie's shotgun and orders his son to get in the truck. He then tells the driver that he's impounding his car when Wendell calls out to Rogers and makes him turn around. The driver tries to grab his shotgun, causing the weapon to go off and hit the tanker, killing everyone in a fiery explosion. Blair finds himself standing in the office of an insurance company. Other than a few puffs of smoke coming out of his mouth, there is no evidence of the terrible fate that took place in the other timeline. Blair struggles to process what seemed like an extremely vivid hallucination, but that doesn't stop her from belittling Gina. She even jokes that the receptionist is insane and hides a shotgun under her desk, but doesn't find it. Before either of them can figure out what's going on, Blair leaves to meet Brian for a trip to Jekyll Island. She tries to tell him about her hallucinations. Things get a lot more vivid when the same tanker truck as before pulls. Up to the gas station where Blair and Brian are waiting in line and when Gina pulls. Up to the store, this time things are a little different. Gina doesn't go into the store, but the sequence of events still leads to Gina pulling out a gun and ordering the truck driver to give her his car. Blair rushes in and begs the secretary not to kill them like last time. When that doesn't work, Blair immediately turns to Agent Rogers. This time, however, Blair notices that he has a nasty bite mark on his wrist. A few seconds later, the woman in the car is attacked by her zombified husband and starts screaming. Gina manages to react when the trucker tries to take the gun away by punching him in the groin. She gets in the car and starts to drive away. Agent Rogers orders her to stop, but she refuses explaining that firing his gun will blow them all up. Blair runs forward and gets in the way of the truck, causing Gina to swerve out of the way, which leads to a fiery crash and explosion. When reality returns to the insurance company office, Gina screams and Blair raises his hands. Up in bewilderment, the rest of the office staff look on with a mixture of curiosity and fear all of them and outwardly wondering if the two women have lost their minds. Gina walks outside in a daze and Blair follows. Both women quickly realize that they are repeating the same horrible events that will happen. To them later that day as Blair begins to hyperanalyze everything that has happened. Gina vaguely recalls going to the gas station because she wanted a snack and the vending machine. In the office was broken, which she had already told her boss repeatedly. Then she tells Blair that this time she won't go to the gas station and to leave her alone. Car with Brian to the gas station when her fiance spots Gina holding the Drivera tanker truck at gunpoint. When Blair gets out and confronts her, Gina angrily explains that she had a flat tire and had no choice. Realizing that she won't be able to talk Gina out of her current actions, Blair rushes to Agent Rogers telling him that his bite looks bad. She demands that he explain what's really going on and why he's in such a hurry to leave Atlanta. Rogers replies that things are much worse. The news reports that people are going crazy and biting each other. The military has also taken over the city and left only to roads open. Then Rogers starts to approach Gina and asks her to put the gun down and again she turns around. 
at the sound of a woman screaming as she is attacked by her undad husband. This time the truck driver takes the opportunity to run away and get into his car. Gina turns around just as Rogers pulls out his gun causing it to go off and kill the truck driver. That would be bad enough on its own, but Wendell has already managed to get into the cab of the truck. As the truck begins to roll forward, Gina hears Wendell screaming for help. She drops her gun and runs after him. Brian demands that Blair get back in the car, but instead she goes to the truck, manages to jump on the hood while Gina tries to calm the boy down and convince him to get in the driver's seat. When the terrified child refuses, she opens the door and gets in the driver's seat. After a few seconds, the zombified truck driver gets up and bites Gina on the neck, while the car hits something and explodes. When reality returns, Gina is shaking and holding her neck where she's just been bitten. Meanwhile, Blair monologues in disbelief that the dead truck driver has come back to life. Much to the confusion and dismay of her office staff, then Gina stands up and starts giving Blair a hard time. Years of resentment erupts into an epic tirade about what a horrible self-centered person she is. The situation escalates when Gina starts talking about how much the entire office hates her, which might not have happened if she had gotten to know her employees a little instead. Of talking about herself all the time, Gina ends up demanding that Blair leave her alone. Just as she is about to leave the insurance office, Blair argues that Gina is really selfish since their time loop wouldn't have happened if she had stayed at her desk. Before walking out the door, Gina remarks that if Blair really cared about her employees, she would have warned them about what was going on outside. Later, Gina is arrested at a gas station thanks to Blair calling the police about having an unregistered gun. The two women begin exchanging insults that quickly escalate into a fight. Their fight is cut short when a tanker truck collides with another car, causing a massive explosion that kills everyone. After that, we're shown Blair and Gina being repeatedly killed as they try to escape the news. The last episode ends with a zombified Gina digging into Blair moments before another explosion. This shared and recurring trauma causes Blair and Gina to grow somewhat while the rest of the insurance office looks on in bewilderment. The women share snacks from the vending machine discussing how horrible their ordeal was. When Blair feels sick and goes to the bathroom, Gina follows to comfort her. Then they sit against the wall and discuss what is about to happen. Blair explains that since the military is shutting down the city, Gina can't leave until she knows what roads are still open. And Blair knows this thanks to Agent Rogers' work many cycles ago. In response, Gina begs Blair to let her leave in peace so she can drive through downtown and get to her family. Blair acquiesces. The next time we see Gina, she's driving away in a truck and smiling, while Agent Rogers vainly demands she stop. When Brian walks in to ask where she's been, Blair asks why he never tried to help her during the countless deaths. After Brian answers with understandable confusion, Blair declares that they're not right for each other and tells him to go to Jackal's Island without her. As soon as Brian leaves, Blair goes outside and lets a couple of zombies get to her. Despite the change in common trajectories, both women revisit the same moment at the insurance office. After telling everyone to go home, Blair and Gina go to the back room to discuss what happened. Gina admits that she didn't even make it downtown. In response, Blair explains how she died. She also apologizes to Jenna for always being horrible to her. Gina responds not particularly kindly, but the beleaguered secretary also admits that Blair helped her become less of a jerk during this ordeal. After this awkward reconciliation, Blair suggests they try something new to break out of the vicious cycle. The two women head to a gas station and pounce on the truck drivers just as the woman in the car is attacked by her husband, Zombie. Blair alerts Agent Rogers to what's going on which allows her and Janito apprehend the driver and easily take his keys. The plan works perfectly, but at the cost of killing Wendell when he approaches Zombie to see what's wrong with him. Despite everything they have seen, both women are still in mental turmoil as they drive away. In the car, Blair tells Jenny how to get to her family, which helps them talk again. 
Gina reveals that she became a secretary despite having a degree in marketing. She had no serious connections to get the job, but her self-confidence and cowardice prevented her from proving herself. Blair responds by saying that she hasn't broken up with Brian because she was afraid of being alone after her father died of cancer. After a police roadblock, both women confess to each other that they are still afraid of what will happen to them next. As the women approach the overpass, the sound of honking horns and screaming convinces them to stop and see what's going on. They look out onto Interstate 85 and see a swarm of zombies flying out of Atlanta. Hungry-looking zombies heading toward a large group of people trapped in a multi-lane accident. They decide to help the people after Gina gets a hose and douses the road with gasoline. Blair throws a cigarette on it. When the cigarette doesn't work, Gina convinces Blair to light one of her favorite neck accessories. They throw it off the overpass and create a wall of fire that slows or stops the zombies from catching up to the people running out of their cars. The women only have time to enjoy a few seconds of righteous satisfaction before the tanker truck explodes, throwing them into the air. Luckily, they are far enough away. The fire only burns them. Rising from the ground, Gina checks her watch and realizes they made it to the moment they were supposed to die. Blair asks if she thinks they're dead. She agrees since she wants to see her father. Gina responds with the theory that Blair infected her with his personality disorder, which in turn led to them creating a shared delusion. This leads to another round of friendly insults and they walk down a deserted highway together. Brooke is getting ready for what looks like an evening at a fancy restaurant. After getting dressed, she is standing at the stern of a river steamer when a young girl Lydia appears and proudly shows off her dress. Lydia's mom, Dee, appears next on stage, and Brooke tries her best to compliment her dress. Dee is very uncomfortable playing dress up in such circumstances, and she wonders if it's a good idea to have this dinner. Brooke assures her that the guards are on duty and have been patrolling the area all week. The party on the riverboat is in full swing, and Lydia continues to show off her beautiful dress. Dee sits down at the bar, and Billy the bartender asks why she's not sitting with her baby. When Dee doesn't answer, Billy asks why don't you put more effort into it. Billy is not shy in his expressions and says that Dee looks like shit, and this is very disrespectful to Brooke, who goes out of her way to provide this sense of normality during the zombie apocalypse. Dee didn't even try to impress anyone and instead looks like a drowned possum. Billy wonders if she understands how many people are willing to kill to take part in this meeting. Dee goes out on the terrace and looks into the distance, into the forest, at the zombies. Brooke joins her and points out that they are just the walking dead. Dee admits that she doesn't trust Billy. Brooke notes that she doesn't trust anyone. Changing the subject, Brooke mentions that Lydia's birthday is coming up and they have to throw a party for her. It's been over a year since Dee and Lydia arrived and that's more than enough time for them to adjust to this life. Dee worries that Lydia has too much hope for her. They're still talking when Dee pulls out a knife, forcing Brooke to duck. They pull out a fishing net with a zombie trapped in it, and Dee pierces it with a knife. Blood is pouring all over Brooke. Without saying anything, Brooke takes the knife from Dee. We have a vision of Dee standing in the shadows during her transition to Alpha. She's bald and says, I was nine when I killed Dad. Dad deserved it. Dee tells her own story and talks about how after the world fell apart. She got stuck in the basement with Lydia's father, Frank. The next day, Brooke urgently leaves physical education class for a meeting about the disappearance of Mr. Langston. Brooke asks Dee if she's seen him and Dee remembers seeing him at the bar the night before. She suggests Brooke talk to Billy because he was serving him. Billy confirms that he served him all night, Mr. Langston was drunk and couldn't walk straight, but Billy insists that he and another man took him back to his room. Mitch thinks they should take a boat and look for him in the swamp, but Nolan thinks if he's gone, then he's gone. Brooke agrees with Nolan, but Jenna can't believe they won't even try to find Mr. Langston. Jenna agrees with Mitch that they should look for him. However, Brooke has the last word, and she says they need to move on. She asks Jenna to call a meeting to inform everyone about what happened. 
D is hiding nearby and hears the whole conversation. D teaches Lydia how to set the table properly, while Lydia explains that Brooke thinks she needs a new dress for a garden party. Lydia talks about how she likes fairies, and D doesn't seem to understand why. Obviously, D is always serious and never takes the time to enjoy anything. Also, this conversation of fairies comes into play later in the episode. They're still setting the table when D puts one of the knives in his pocket. Lydia asks why and D assures her that it's just in case they need it. Lydia knows that her mom wants to leave and suggests that D go without her. You're going to die without me, D says. Lydia thinks her mom believes she's going to die no matter what. Lydia tells D that she has Brooke and D leaves angry. D spots Billy near the anchors and sees him throwing something into the water. He acts like he has no idea what she's talking about when she asks if it was a mirror. D thinks there are people nearby and calls Brooke for help. D explains to Brooke and the others that she thinks Billy was signaling someone in the woods with a mirror. Billy calls her crazy and says they can check him in the mirror if they want. D says they won't find him. Billy dropped him in the water when he noticed her watching him. Billy points out that there is no one in the woods and Nolan who has a better view from the upper deck, agrees. He only sees walkers in the woods. D reveals that Billy was the last person to see Mr. Langston alive, and that Billy was only there for three weeks. Brooke asks D what she wants to do with Billy, and D doesn't hesitate to answer. She thinks they need to get rid of him. Billy notices a knife in D's pocket and panics, screaming that she wants to kill him before jumping overboard into the water. Brooke becomes angry and says, No wonder Lydia is afraid of you, which pisses off Dee. Dee demands Brooke stop talking to her daughter. Brooke orders Dee to cover Billy's shifts since she cost them a worker. If Dee does that ever again, she's gone. Lydia witnessed the argument and runs off. Dee goes after her as Alpha chimes in, saying, I went mad in that basement. Lydia saw. Dee enters their room and... In her sweetest voice possible says everything's okay, but the room's empty. Brooke comes up behind her and says that Lydia needs space. Dee asks where her daughter is and Brooke questions why Lydia's afraid of her own mother. Dee threatens to use the knife on Brooke if she doesn't tell her where her daughter's hiding. Their battle of wills is interrupted by a scream. Someone's dead and now Dee's even more adamant that she needs to know where Lydia is. The group shocked to discover that Billy not only survived jumping into the water, but Dee was also right about him being a bad guy. He forces the group onto their knees and holds them at gunpoint. He explains that with Mr. Langston gone a spot opened up and he needs six more spots to open up to make room for his men. Billy goes on a short rant about how Brooke is trying to keep everything in order on the boat. He doesn't understand why they should let people on board who look like they've given up. Billy begins to sort through the group, trying to decide who should die to make room for his men. Nolan suggests he should go after Dee for spoiling his plan. And Billy asks where she and Lydia are. Todd lies and says they went on a run. But Billy isn't stupid. He knows their schedule and sends one of his men to find them. One of his men locates Brooke and is about to kill her when Billy orders him to take it easy with her. Billy thinks they need strong people to build up what they have and says she needs him to take over things while she continues to be her sweet self. Billy shoots a member of the group and Brooke tries to negotiate an end to the deaths by suggesting there's enough room for all his men. Billy doesn't listen and thinks she'll grow to like him as he kills another person. Nolan takes the coward's way out and tells Billy to take Jenna since she doesn't do anything. Jenna fights back and wants Billy to kill Nolan instead. They all volunteer to help to find Dee and Lydia except for Todd who seems to be the only decent member of the group. While they're debating who's next, Dee sneaks in and slits the throat of the man holding Brooke. She then shoots another one of Billy's men before undoing the rope to a dinghy and jumping into the water. Fighting and gunshots break out on the riverboat while Dee is trying to silence. A screaming Lydia who's yelling for Brooke to run. Dee yells at her to quiet down reminding Lydia that she's her mama and will listen to her. Dee and Lydia make it to shore and Dee fights off a few zombies before one falls on top of Dee, effectively trapping her. She cuts it open and demands Lydia get under the zombie with her. 
They watch someone from the riverboat crawl up on the shore and then get attacked and eaten by a zombie. He smears blood on Lydia's face and instructs her to pretend she's somewhere else. He promises not to let anything get her. D and Lydia make it into the woods and are wandering around when D spots Brooke. Before Lydia can see Brooke, D takes earmuffs out of a bag, puts them on her daughter, and tells her to stay there until she comes back. D stands in front of Brooke and reminds her that she promised Lydia the world and then took it away from her. Brooke blames all the deaths on the riverboat on D, and D points out they would have killed Lydia too. I did what a real mother would do, she says. D points the gun at Brooke's head as Lydia comes running up begging her not to kill her. D pushes her daughter to the side and takes aim again. Lydia curls up in the fetal position, covers her ears, and sings a song. D attempts to calm Lydia down, assuring her she won't kill Brooke. D puts away the gun and returns to Brooke. She tells Brooke that death is too good for her and then cuts a long slice across her face. This is my mark and everywhere you go I'll be there reminding you how you failed my little girl. Growls D. Lydia wants to go back to the boat, but D tells her it's just them now. Lydia accuses D of getting what she wanted, for Brooke to be wrong. D thinks everything Brooke was teaching Lydia was a lie. Lydia asks where her dad is because she doesn't want to be with D. D explains to Lydia that her daddy was weak. She should not be like him. They make their way to an RV park and find an empty RV. D searches it and discovers. A T said and actually smiles while telling Lydia that maybe they can have their own party. Lydia doesn't hear this because she's gone back outside and thinks she sees people from the boat. These new rivals are zombies and T orders her daughter to get behind her. When Lydia makes a move to get back in the RV, D grabs her and tells her it's time to learn how to survive. She wants Lydia to learn how to take down a zombie but Lydia's unwilling to take the knife. Lydia screams that she can't do it, so Dee's forced to pull a canopy down on the zombies. She then stabs them in their heads through the canopy. After dispatching the undead, Dee sees Lydia running away and gives chase. We see Dee transformed into Alpha, as she says, We are all we have. We do what we think is right, even if it hurts the ones we love. He finds Lydia under a tree, and Lydia claims she can hear fairies and they want to take her away. She begs her mom to let her go. Dee holds her while telling her she loves her so much. Dee tells Lydia she's tired and, to close her eyes, Dee grabs her knife and Alpha narrates what's happening. She was so small, but I would have killed the both of us. Suddenly Dee also hears voices saying, we see you. Lydia opens her eyes and is certain she was right that the trees are talking. Dee screams. Who's there? A group of people wearing zombie faces walk up and the leader tells Dee to whisper. She takes off her zombie mask and introduces herself as Hira. She then kicks Dee in the face and knocks her out. Tales of the Walking Dead episode 3 ends with Alpha getting the last word. That was the end of Dee and the beginning of me. She walks up to the mask Hira once wore and says, and then I met you, and you showed me love. Dr. Charles Everett narrates while all sorts of animals and reptiles fill the screen. The animals give way to what he refers to as Homo mortuus, also known as walkers and a variety of other names. Charles has spent years tracking the migration pattern of the dead, including specific zombies that he's given names. After coming across headless zombie bodies, Charles is more concerned that humans are being vile and hunting zombies for sport than with zombies killing humans. He uses a drone to track the person he believes just beheaded these zombies and that's when we meet the episode titles Amy. Amy spots the drone and yells for help. While doing so she falls down an embankment. She begins to fight as she's surrounded by zombies while Charles watches from a short distance away. Amy's on the ground tussling with a zombie wearing a tracker and is just about to stab it with her makeshift hand when Charles finally steps in. He stops her from killing the zombie and helps her escape. Doctor, Everett isn't into small talk or pleasantries. He walks away as Amy tries to introduce herself and explain that she's lost and got separated from her group. While following him, she admits she doesn't feel good her head and stomach are killing her. 
Amy assures Charles she didn't get bit and asks for painkillers, but her taciturn savior continues to ignore her. Amy grows frustrated and says she's not going to rob him. His only response is, I don't work with humans. Despite his bad attitude, Amy continues to follow Dr. Everett through the woods as he sets up cameras for his zombie studies. He leaves her behind yet even though she's sick, she makes it to his door and pounds on it. Amy begs for a minute of his time, but he doesn't respond. She's starting to attract a small herd of zombies when she figures out a way to climb his ladder. She's safe for now but still outside when she asks what the point of rescuing her was. If he's just going to leave her there as bait. She apologizes in advance if she takes a chunk out of his neck after dying from her stomach illness. He finally opens the door. He whips up a concoction for her to drink and then goes through her things. He finds nightshade berries which are poisonous if they're not fully ripe. She's basically slowly killing herself by eating them. He hands her a bucket and warns. The next 24 hours is going to be unpleasant for the both of us, but mostly you. She gets to drinking. Amy's feeling much better the next morning and thanks him for his help. She asks where he went in the middle of the night because she woke up and he was gone. A man of few words, he tells her he had stuff to do. She complains the poison felt like her but got sucked up through her esophagus. He corrects her. As a doctor, he knows that's not physically possible. Dr. Everett doesn't have a sense of humor. Amy's a chatterbox and asks what he's doing. Charles becomes frustrated because he needs to finish his work. She ignores his frustration and continues to talk. She explains she found books at an old school on biology and algebra. She likes the bird section. Amy changes the subject and asks if he's trigger happy with the chompers, her name for zombies, and he reveals he's found Homo Mortuus with their heads chopped off. He wants to know if she's responsible and she claims she's not. Doctor. Everett doesn't believe humans belong in this area that's the point of the trench. She wonders if he's seen just how bad it is on the other side of the trench. Amy then confesses the skull hunters are helping her group cross the trench. And that angers Charles. He insists that's the problem with Homo sapiens all they do is take and when nature corrects it. They do it all over again. Amy admits she's confused and asks if he's rooting for the chompers. They argue and he finally orders Amy to leave. Before she does, she notices he has a lot of photos of Specimen 21. That zombie is the only one he hasn't named that he's studying. Amy's curious if he knows that zombie and he responds by telling her to leave again. But then, he changes his mind and reveals he's studying their behavioral psychology and migration patterns. He insists that's all Specimen 21 is to him. She thinks that's ridiculous. Chompers just walk around and kill people. Period. Doctor. Everett recalls Specimen 21 killing a wild dog and instead of taking it all for himself, he left it behind for the rest of the herd. Specimen 21's done this twice and that leads him to believe even in this state he is a protector. She still thinks the zombie's someone he knew. Maybe he's studying him hoping there's more in there than just dead brains. He insists science is everything and that's all this is for him. He blames her for damaging 21's tag and that's why he lost track of him. He needs to find him and retag him. Amy suddenly realizes Charles wasn't really saving her yesterday he was saving 21. His parting words are, bye, don't come back. Amy sets off through the woods and encounters specimen 21. She begins to track it by marking the trees. Charles collects the arm of a zombie and returns home to find Amy waiting for him. She informs him she found his friend. She could tell him 21's location but thinks it would be nice if he helps her find her group. In exchange, before giving her an answer, he wants to know if she's thought about what he said that she doesn't want to live there because it's dangerous. She thinks she could just as easily die there as she could on the other side of the trench. She assures him her people are kind, and they're just trying to find somewhere to live. Her community means everything to her. He agrees they'll leave tomorrow. The next morning, she explains that she marked trees while tracking 21. His surprise that she thought of doing that is an insult, but she lets it go. She asks, again, why he's studying zombies and what he's getting out of it. 
In response, he shows her videos of all types of animals that have escaped from zoos and are now thriving. On this side of the trench, he adds that the animals are growing bigger because humans don't exist in this area. Dr. Everett was part of a group studying the environment since the shift but there were disagreements that fractured their group. He gave up his life for this and plans to see it through. He thinks Homo mortuus are a part of all of this. Charles explains he's been observing some of these zombies for seven years and never interferes. Amy points out he did when she almost killed one of his specimens. She also reminds him that human connections are all they have. Charles insists humans can connect on the other side of the trench, not there. They carry on an actual friendly conversation. And he explains the homo mortuus don't bother him because he's wearing a jacket made of their skin. He knows she liked poetry and offers to let her borrow a poetry book. She wonders what will happen to the zombies if all the humans die. They can't reproduce. He thinks that's an astute observation. She comes across a bird that's on the verge of extinction and that brings a smile to her face until it joins its flock and flies away. Charles has changed his opinion of his traveling companion and offers her a position. As his assistant, he won't live forever and when he dies, she could take over the research. She has a counteroffer he should join her people and teach them about the animals and his research. He thinks it's not that simple. He finally reveals that after his research team split up, he found a colleague living where he now lives. They continued their research together for a while, but then his colleague died from cancer. Before he passed on, he asked Dr. Everett to study him after he turns. That colleague is Specimen 21. They're still searching for Specimen 21 when they come across a headless zombie. Charles becomes angry, aware that she lied to him about her group. Amy explains the skull collectors offered to help them cross the trench. If they help them collect heads. Just then Amy hears one of her people screaming and runs in that direction. One of her friends is already dead and a zombie's feasting on him. The other friend is still alive and being attacked when Amy tries to help her out. Dr. Everett grabs Amy, insisting she let nature take its course. Humans are part of the food chain. Amy begins to scream to draw the zombies away from her friend. Dr. Everett quickly covers her mouth. She bites him and gets away. Amy stabs one of the zombies and her friend kicks the other one down an embankment. Dr. Everett realizes that one is Specimen 21. He sheds his gear to chase after it as it starts to float away down the creek. Before he can get too far, he trips and falls. His head is bleeding as he begs Amy to help him save 21. She refuses because he left her friends to die. Dr. Everett insists he's sorry and knows he's selfish. He assures her he will do anything she wants him to. He tries to get up and go after 21 by himself but falls again. Still, he's able to grab a rope and snag it on the floating debris 21's on. He begins to pull it in while assuring 21 he's going to be okay. Suddenly, an alligator appears and grabs 21. Dr. Everett refuses to let go of the rope and is being dragged closer to the water when Amy cuts the rope. She screams at him for not helping her friends and for just making up his own rules. He sees a flock of birds and points out that her group is in the way of the zombies migration route. None of her people are going to make it out alive. She wants to warn them but he's sure it's too late. He reminds her that this area is dangerous. If she goes to her friend's location, she will meet the same fate. Amy says she'd rather die than end up like him. With that, she leaves. Amy runs through a pack of zombies and finds her people. Dr. Everett makes it back home and is able to verify on video that Amy made it through the herd. After the herds moved on, Dr. Everett reaches Amy's friend's camp. The aftermath of a zombie attack is evident. And he wanders through the camp reciting his favorite Emily Dixon poem. He climbs into the back of a truck and discovers trunks full of zombie heads. He looks around the camp again and tags one zombie. His eyes are then drawn to another one. Amy has turned and he holds her off while attempting to place a tracker on her. <laughs> Davin waking up from a blow to the head. The season's penultimate episode is told in a non-linear style. 
So it's a bit confusing to see this just introduced character is handcuffed to a zombie who's trying to attack him. Davin experiences a brief flashback of a woman and some drawings on a wall. He grabs a prostatic leg and begins to hit the zombie over the head with it. It's the dead of night as this is going down, and a little girl finds him. He asks for help, and she yells for her mom. It's obvious she knows him as she yells, Davin, it's him, he's here, before running off. Davin is oblivious to what's happening and so is the audience. The zombie wakes up, and he hallucinates the dead person calling him a murderer. As Davin drags the zombie along, he continues to hallucinate. The zombie accuses him of doing this to her and says that's why they're looking for him. He briefly hides under an upturned tree and then continues walking with the zombie to a small boathouse. Unfortunately, he's unable to get inside it. He discovers a photo in his boot and keys on the zombie. Who are you? He asks, and the zombie responds, 897. Davin keeps walking through the community, and the zombie says the numbers again. Right as they stumble upon that address, Davin has a flashback of two French-Canadian women and of his leg being chopped off. The story leaps backward seven weeks, finally allowing viewers to begin to piece together what's transpired. Two women rescue Davin, and he regains consciousness in bed to discover one of his saviors tending to the wound on his leg. He asks for his boot, and one of the women hands him the photo of his family that was inside of it. Flipping back to the present, Davin and his zombie friend enter 897's garage. There are pieces of flesh, blood, and his missing boot on the floor. The zombie begins to explain this is where he killed her, as he experiences multiple. Rapid flashbacks. He has a vision of the woman becoming a zombie and of her saying, sometimes murder is mercy. He's done dragging the zombie around and grabs a hacksaw. He cuts off the zombie's hand so that she's no longer his shadow. Davin carries the zombie inside and lays it on the table. He's struck with another flashback of the women, Nora and pre-zombie Amanda, along with himself and a teenage boy named Arno sitting at that very table, enjoying a meal. Amanda explains her son, Arno, got the scar on his throat because he and his father went out to far beyond the wall. His father didn't make it back. After that fond memory, Davin smiles at the zombie and says, Amanda, I'm sorry. He glances at a piano and remembers Nora teaching him how to play. She encouraged him to keep trying, and the flashback reveals there was an attraction between him and Nora. A shadowy figure watched from behind. Davin begins to explore the house and makes his way upstairs. After tending to the wound on his head, he has yet another flashback when he spots a poster on the wall. This time his vision shows him waking up in bed after being rescued and Nora and Amanda giving him glasses because his were broken. He finds out he's in Maine and recalls telling these helpful strangers that he ran into an unfriendly man in the woods. He didn't shoot the man, but the man shot him. He believes murder isn't the only option, but Amanda disagrees. Amanda thinks sometimes murder is the only option. A short leap back in time shows Davin clearly hearing a child repeatedly saying the same thing. In French through a vent, he heads down to the basement to investigate and discovers a zombie child chained up down there. He has a flashback of stabbing it in the head and of Amanda coming down the stairs. She said, sometimes murder is mercy, before placing a black hood over his head. Back to another flashback, Devon is bringing Nora strawberries, which makes her happy. She wanted some for her salad, even though Davin thinks adding them ruins the salad. There is some flirtation going on between the two. And now to the present. Davin is tied up to a gravestone as the hood's removed from his head. The angry mob calls him a murderer and wonders how he could do this to children. Even Nora is there, and she also believes he's done something. Arno steps forward and drops to his knees next to Amanda's body, accusing Davin of killing his mother. Davin insists he didn't do it and would only kill if he was forced to or if someone was trying to kill him. Arno weeps as he calls his mother a good, kind person who took care of everyone. Arno suggests Davin murdered her after she discovered what he did. Davin still has no clue what's going on and what they're talking about. The angry mob demands to know where the children are, and Davin continues to be confused. He admits he saw one boy, and then one by one they all begin to extend their hands, palms up. It's some sort of signal they use to vote. Davin attempts to get Nora to tell him what's happening as she drops to her knees in front of him. She begs him to say where he saw the boy, and he confirms it was in the basement. They drag Davin to a van and sentence him to death for killing children. They order him to get into the van and reveal it will be crushed once he's inside. 
Davin's memory seems to clear a little amid the chaos, and he pleads with them, again claiming he's innocent. He thinks it was Amanda who killed the children, and if they do this to him, an innocent man will be put to death for murders he didn't commit. That will make them all murderers. He begs Nora for help as they toss him into the van. Once inside he has a flashback of drawings of boys, and that triggers a memory. Davin recalls being in the basement and seeing boys chained up down there. Amanda found him there and told him he didn't belong in the basement. As the bulldozer is about to crush the van, Davin screams out that there's a boy who's still alive. Nora orders the execution be put on hold as Davin says the boy is her son, Garen. The execution is still moving forward, despite Nora's plea for them to stop. The townsfolk think Davin's lying to save himself. As she and Davin continue to scream, the bulldozer begins to crush the van. Nora tries to stop the man operating the bulldozer, and a fight breaks out. The angry mob is divided and fights amongst themselves as Davin sees Arno running away. The next morning Davin returns to the boathouse that he couldn't get into before and sees Arno entering it. He quietly peeks in the door and sees Garen chained up. Arno is lecturing Garen about how it was very bad of him to run away but he forgives him. Arno tells Garen that whenever he was scared, his mom would give him a treat. Davin has a flashback of reading in his room when he heard the child through the vent. He visualizes going down to the basement and finding a boy chained up there who was repeating flavors over and over, just like Arno is doing to Garen right now. Davin remembers seeing Garen in the basement and trying to free the boy but being thwarted by Amanda who then knocked him out. Garen got away and Amanda tried to stop him, but Davin fought her off. Davin then handcuffed himself to her so couldn't go after Garen. They made it into the garage and during the struggle, she face planted into a bucket of acid. Her face melted and she died. Right after she passed away, Arno hit Davin in the head with a tire iron. We get caught up on all the events as we see Davin waking up and then carrying Amanda through the woods. He was looking for help before collapsing. Snippets of scenes we've already been shown flow by, but now we see Garen is in them too. Garen was with Davin right before Davin passed out. Davin enters the boathouse and confronts Arno with a wooden club. Arno is armed with a knife as he confesses he knew Davin would be a problem, but because of Nora he was allowed to stay. Davin is stunned and asks why he's killing kids, and Arno reveals he's saving them from growing up in the world that they now live in now. He parrots his mom and says, sometimes murder is mercy. Davin realizes Amanda knew what her son was doing. Arno gets upset that Davin is bringing up his mother. Arno explains that, at first, Amanda didn't know, but then she caught him. She tried to save his first victim, but they realized they couldn't let him go because he'd tell. They wound up leaving him in the woods. Apparently, Amanda wouldn't do anything about it because Arno is her son and she'd almost lost him once. She didn't want to lose him for good. Davin and Arno have made it out of the boathouse and are in the nearby field. He can hear zombies beneath him and that distracts Arno just enough for Davin to hit him with the club. Davin then pulls back a piece of wood and exposes to zombie children who've been buried beneath it. Davin screams Nora's name over and over as Arno drops to his knees begging Davin not to do this. He swears he'll leave and never come back. Garen walks outside as Nora and the others come running. Garen tells everyone what Arno's been doing and Arno calls Garen a liar. Fortunately, no one believes Arno. Davin calls Arno a murderer and addresses the townspeople. You would have killed me. Do you even care? Would you have regretted it when Arno killed another one? of your children and then you realized that it wasn't even me. Davin tells them they don't have to live like this. There is still life out there. There is still hope. Nora isn't swayed by Davin's powerful words and slaps Arno in the face. One by one the others run up and hit or kick Arno. As Arno is being dragged toward the hole, he tries one last time to blame Davin. The men dragging him toss him in with the two zombie boys he killed. He dies a fitting death, being bit by those he murdered. 
The most confusing episode of the season ends with Davin walking away and saying in French, I will see. The final episode of season one opens with a couple standing in the dark. They're in the woods and eerie screams and creepy whispers can be heard as they take off running. Daylight arrives and the woman, Adalia, makes note that Maria a zombie is still following them. She thinks she knows where they are and may know of a place they can stay, but just for the night. Eric wonders why they'd only stay one night and Adalia explains the woman who lives there is kind of a healer. She's into spells and other mystical stuff. It's dark by the time they arrive at a gate surrounded by tall walls. Upon entering the house, Adalia hears a woman whispering in Spanish. And now in the hour of our death. Amen, the voice says. Adalia looks around but one's there. Within the episode's first few minutes it's obvious the season will finish up with a haunted house tale. Weapons drawn, they set off to explore the house. There are candles lit and religious figurines are the home's primary decorations. Eric and Adalia are convinced they're alone until they see a woman, La Doa, of the episode's title, in white standing in front of them. They're still trying to get over the shock of seeing her when she yells at them to leave. Adalia attempts to convince the elderly woman they won't hurt her and that they just need a place to stay. The homeowner warns them they cannot stay but has a change of heart when Adalia begins to shed tears and begs in Spanish to stay. Adalia promises they'll leave in the morning. And the healer takes pity on them and offers the couple food. After they wash up, the woman asks, for the second time, how Adalia knew where she lived. Adalia insists a woman named Maria who'd been to the house told her before the zombies got her. They were traveling together, and Maria told her she was a healer. As they eat dinner, Eric asks why she won't let them stay. He points out that it's freezing outside, and she has all this space to herself. Since it's just the two of them, they won't take up much room. Idalia wants him to stop and let it go, but Eric refuses. Lodoa tells them no, again, and asks them to leave. Eric becomes mad and grabs her, and she begins to choke. She hits the edge of the table, falls to the ground, and dies. Blood spreads around her dead body. As Adalia washes La Doa's blood off, she looks down at her reflection in the water and suddenly sees hands around her throat. She begins to choke but when she glances at the mirror, she's shocked that the hands have disappeared. A short while later Adalia attempts to relax by the fire. She's jumpy but Eric doesn't seem to care about what just happened. He believes the house is there since the woman died, but Adalia's not on the same page. Just because the woman is dead doesn't mean they can take her belongings and her house. After a little persuading, she's okay with staying there, for now. While exploring, Adalia moves photos, extinguishes some candles, and lights others on what appears to be set up as a small altar. As she kneels to pray, she hears the deceased La Doa say, This is my house. Eric does his own exploring and hears strange noises. Fortunately, there's nothing supernatural about their source. La Doa had a parrot and it's a talkative little creature. The uninvited squatters sit down to eat again. And Eric makes a bad joke about how the lady didn't know what was going to happen tonight. Idalia doesn't find it funny and warns him they need to be careful about what they say because it's bad energy. Eric doesn't buy into that at all. Eric lays down in the woman's bed. But Idalia is seriously creeped out about sleeping in La Doa's bed. Eric insists it's fine. Plus, it's a real bed, something they don't come across often in these zombie apocalypse times. As they're lying in bed the floorboards begin to creak. Idalia rolls over and sees a woman bent over the bed. Suddenly, the candles go out. As Idalia lights a match she says out loud, La Doa. Idalia wanders around the house and repeatedly says in Spanish, he didn't mean any harm. She eventually makes her way down into the basement and hears voices. She finds a wall dripping blood and instead of getting the hell out of there, she explores some more. A zombie startles her. Eric inspects the area where Adalia insists she saw a zombie and, of course, there's nothing there. He thinks maybe she had a bad dream and suggests she rest. Eric's sure this is all in her head. The next day Adalia's waking nightmares take a dramatic turn for the worse when the Jesuses, 
on crucifixes come to life and climb down the wall. They jump on her and she tries to swat them off, finally taking refuge in a room where she finds a picture of La Doa. Completely freaked out, I mean, who wouldn't be? She grabs a jacket and tells Eric she feels cooped up like she's just waiting to be attacked, or something. He notices the rosary around her neck and wonders when started believing in God. She replies, since today. After Adalia leaves, Eric checks on the parrot and covers its cage. The parrot surprises Eric and says, don't hurt me. He asks the parrot why it would say that and why would he hurt it, but then becomes frustrated and tells the parrot to be quiet. Before shutting the door to the room, it asks, what did you do? Adalia walks around in the fog outside and hears La Dola say, this is my land. Adalia produces her knife as she begins to hear what sounds like zombies. She swings her knife around, blindly, unable to make anything out due to the thick fog. She has a brief reprieve from her fright and even laughs to herself when she sees a chicken and thinks it must have been the source of the noise. It's not. La Doa is standing at the top of the stairs and she yells, intruder. Back inside the house, Eric threatens the parrot because it won't shut. Up and Adalia confesses she's been hearing whispers and sometimes even seeing things. She gets angry at how Eric's looking at her. And he explains he doesn't think she's weird but... He does think it's weird she thinks she's seeing things. According to Adalia, it's weird he's okay with all of this. The parrot makes noises again and Eric has had it with the bird. Adalia wonders if he's glad the old lady died, assuring him he can tell her the truth. He believes this is their house now, things change, and that's the end of the story. The parrot makes a noise again and Eric slams his hands down on the table, startling Adalia. After apologizing, he gives in and says they can leave if she wants. Later that night while trying to be intimate, Adalia thinks Eric bites her and she pushes him off. He's confused and she inspects her shoulder, there isn't a bite mark there. Adalia's done with the house's shenanigans and starts packing, determined to leave first thing in the morning. If he won't come with her, she'll leave by herself. Eric wakes alone in bed in the middle of the night. The parrot's making a lot of noise, but now he thinks it's flying around as it squawks. As walks down the hall, pictures of him and Adalia fly off the wall around him. We see flashes of the couple killing people, actual living human beings, not zombies. The parrot speaks for everyone when it asks, what did you do? Eric runs into the bathroom but then suddenly comes to, standing in the room with the parrot's cage. The parrot is dead in his hand. Adalia finds him and can't believe he killed the bird. While digging a grave for the parrot, he hears noises at the gate. He sees Maria standing there, looking alive and well and not at all like a zombie. He looks at her legs and sees a bone sticking out of her ankle as she asks him to let her in. Eric refuses, telling her she's dead. Maria yells for Adalia and then claims that Adalia did this to her. He begins to open the gate, but Adalia closes it and drags him away. Maria yells, you both will pay for what you have done. Eric insists Maria's alive, but Adalia knows she's not. It's all in his head and he's hearing things. Eric grabs his head as if he's in pain and reminds Adalia that she's the one hearing things, and now she's putting things in his head. They argue about who's crazier and about what they really did to Maria and her friends. Apparently, these two were horrible human beings even before they stole La Donna's house. Adalia's hallucinations accelerate and she hears La Doa claiming the house is still hers and Maria begging for help. She also sees all the people they killed are now zombies in the basement walls. Adalia comes up from the basement covered in blood and reveals all of their victims are down there. She starts to blame him for their deaths, but he reminds her they did it together to survive. The house shakes and Eric screams at her that it is just a house and it's all in her head, demanding that she stop it. Adalia thinks she's holding a gun and screams back that it's not her. She looks down and the gun has turned into a glass cross. They run to the window and see La Doa crawling out of the grave they put her in. The window breaks and finally Eric says they have to leave. As they run around the house, La Doa appears around every corner. She tosses their bodies simply by pushing her hands toward them. She claims that even in death this house belongs to her. She uses powers to open the door and push them toward it. But Eric and Adalia turn on each other. They blame each other for what's happening as they somehow end up downstairs heading toward the zombies. As they fight, Eric continues to insist this is all in her head. 
Lights flash as the killer couple get sucked into the house by the roots of a massive tree. There's one final flash of lights and then they lie still on the ground, dead. The camera pans to a portrait of La Doe and her parrot. And that's a wrap on a very uneven first season.